I used to work in the grinding department at a huge aerospace company for a few years. I trained and worked under some of the best craftsmen I know. We were doing well and the company needed a few more hands to assist with the workload. One guy really stood out with his grinding techniques. He was a lot younger than some of the other machinists I worked alongside. He was maybe in his early 40s? Now remember, a lot of the guys in this shop were in their late 50s and early 60s, and some should have been retired for a few years. He came in and learned the machines pretty quickly. They threw him on a machine after a few weeks and off he went. At first, we didn't really watch his quality or quantity of work until a particular job came along, mainly because the way he programmed it and ran it wasn't normal to the other operators. At this shop, we would get sketch sheets for the operation number that was being called out in the planning. The operation could vary from green grinding locating surfaces for the lathe to chuck up on, or finish grinding the part to final size, or even grinding threads and grooves. It really just depended on what needed to be done to that part at a specific operation. A lot of the jobs had an operation called an OD chamfer chamfer. To describe it simply, it involved a plunge grinding an OD, indexing the wheel 45 degrees, putting a chamfer with the wheel face, then finally using the side of that wheel to put another 45 degree edge brake on the other side. Now the OD grind was simple, but the edge brakes required a little map. Say the edge brake called out for a 30 thousandths deep, since it was at a 45 degree angle, we would go double that plus some. We would also use a plunge grind to create that same angle. So at 30 thousandths chamfer, we would be grinding from 80 thousandths away for stock allowance. Feed rates is what slowed us down. Our standard was close to 6 thousandths, 5 thousandths, and 4 thousandths inch a minute. So this is what we used to grind most green to semi-finished parts, and our finish wheel crept even slower than that. At the time, I always thought that the specific end feed was acceptable for most applications. This excess stock allowance really slowed down the cycle time and easily created a 35 to 45 minute program. But like every production shop, this shop would have time standards. But these time standards were from 15 to 20 years ago when the parts were still getting ground on a manual grinder. Now they are being ran on a CNC and are 10 times faster to produce. But due to management not obtaining another time standard, the operators would take advantage of this opportunity to run the parts slower because they could and the upper level would never know. Not all these workers would partake in this because some knew that the company could outsource and get the work done cheaper and faster somewhere else. Most people knew that and worked at the industry standard for this company just to try to prevent the work from being outsourced. Everyone was on the same page with this because, hey, the boss didn't know and we were making numbers, so who cares? Well, all of that changed when the company brought in this 90-day guy, Tim to hire. This guy coming from the outside where there was a more of a standard to be set hit us with something we haven't seen and most people didn't like that. He was at his machine and this job comes rolling up. He sets the job up, finds size, and goes in to run. After a few hours, he was done with the 30 or so parts that arrived at his desk. A job like this would usually take between one to two days if it was ran between two shifts. Of course, management loved it, but oh boy did the co-workers hate him. He's going too fast, or he's going to burn the parts, they would argue. Well, after they got involved, the parts went to inspection. Then the process engineers had to come out. They inspected the parts for burns and cracks and found none. Then the heat treat supervisor got called. Finally, Heat Treat answered everybody's concern when explaining that the parts are carburized, but they're not heat treated yet, so it's highly unlikely that these parts could be burned. After the inspection fiasco, the operator just carried on grinding faster than pretty much everyone, so I stuck to him as much as I could because there I wanted to learn more, not to do the same as everybody else. This guy understood that today's grinding wheels and machine rigidity allows for safer and heavier cuts. He didn't run to our known standard, he was running double or even triple that. For that part, he was grinding the angles 18, 16, 8 thousandths inch a minute compared to our 5, 4, and 3. The other operators didn't care for him as much, but he would make it a point that we want to go fast. We want to bring the work in and push it out. We want to get the work back from the outside sources and do as much work as possible in-house. More in-house work means better job security and possible more overtime. Some people came around and accepted that and would increase their production time and others stuck in their ways because to them, there's only one way to make the part right. In this industry, speed is what makes the money. Grinding can be a tedious process, but it doesn't always have to be slow. It's important to understand your will and your machine capabilities. Now the parts, sometimes you have no choice but to grind slow. But if your parameters are right, you'd be surprised about how fast you can go and still make good parts. So is there an industry standard or a cultural disease in your shop? Thanks, I'm Chris from Titans of CNC. Be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for more grinding content coming your way.